Okay, we are, we are coming to the end of our journey through Paul's letter to the church in Rome. So we're right at the end. If you've got a Bible, you can turn to chapter 16. A couple of weeks ago, I think it was, might be three weeks ago, I'm not sure, we, um, we looked at the first part of that chapter, concluding that bit about greet one another with a holy kiss. No, you were here. You were here for that. No, you missed the kiss this morning. Do you know what, though? No, no, no. But we can do it now, can't we? It's okay, we can do it now. So, you know, really fine. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. He's so keen, isn't he? He's so keen. What's that all about? It's actually, I mean, some churches they'll do it very formally and they'll, you know, the peace of God be upon you and they do, they do a recited phrase. All right? I'm not into repeating the same phrase all the time, but I am into doing things that are biblical. And so it wasn't just a one-off sermon where I said, oh, isn't that interesting you said that and then we forget it. Actually, greeting each other with a holy kiss or a holy hug or a holy handshake or a holy physical, whatever you feel most comfortable with, or a holy nod because you really don't want any physical contact, all right? Whatever it is, there's something about being the family of God and the unity. And actually, even whether we say, oh, peace be upon you or, or bless you, God bless you, it doesn't matter. Right? You can say what you want to say. What we're saying is, I'm not ashamed of you being part of the family of God. And you're not ashamed of me. And love is central to being part of the family of God. That's what we're saying. So, two minutes. George is up for a hug. I tell you, if you don't know, that is a miracle, okay? That's a miracle. That is a miracle, George up for a hug. So, I'm just going to say, we have a couple of minutes. Just go and greet someone, or two people. You don't, you know, just check their body language. If their arms go out, you know they're up for a hug. You can go in for a hug. If they're very, if they put their hand out, it's a handshake. If they're like that, it's a fist bump. All right? But greet one another with a holy kiss. Come on, let's go and say hello to each other. Come on, everyone. Come on. And he talks about the whole thing of this, this, this waiting, this eager longing. There's going to be a day coming when the Spirit is going to make all things new. New creation. New bodies. If you're suffering with a, a body that's getting older, I'm aching today. I am really aching today. I dug up two trees in the garden like this week, and I can feel it. It's like, oh! Ten years ago, I could have done that and not noticed, but, ah! Oh, come on, I'm getting old. Yeah, if you start to ache and think, yes, you don't, there's a hope. <laughs> no more pain. 
they were all paid. It's amazing. And then he goes into all this one great advice and stuff. So, so how would you conclude? How would you conclude this great letter to these people that he's writing to? Let's read these last few verses. Now, all glory to God, who is able to make you strong, just as my good news says. This message about Jesus Christ has revealed his plan for you Gentiles. A plan kept secret from the beginning of time, but now, as the prophets foretold, and as the eternal God has commanded, this message is made known to all Gentiles everywhere. So that they too might believe and obey him. All glory to the only wise God through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. That's how he finishes his letter. And I want us just to look at the beginning and end of that paragraph. We're just going to look at that. All right, so now all glory to God who is able, all glory to the only wise God through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. What Paul's doing there is he's almost taking what he did at the beginning in chapter 1 and just summarising it again. Going, hey, this is the gospel, the good news of Jesus. It brings glory to God. And then he kind of concludes it at the end. So who is able? Who is able? The only wise God. That's his able. And because he is able, he should receive all glory. Forever. And that glory comes through Jesus Christ. That's the only way. It's the only way to bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. But in what ways is God able? In what ways is he able? Well, Paul's letter, he states God is able to make you strong. That's what he says. He's able to make you strong. But throughout the Bible, we find lots of different mentions of God being able to do something. God is able to something. And so I'm just going to pick on three that I think are important for us this morning. Right, God is able to save and save completely. God is able to judge with justice and fairness and God is able to keep us from falling. They're the three things I want us to think about as we conclude all this from Romans. And I'm going to use some other scriptures to help unpack that from what Paul has said in his letter. So the first one, God is able to save. God is able to save completely. This is Hebrews chapter 7. There were many priests. I remember the Jews had this whole temple system where they would come, they would offer um, unblemished sheep, uh, lambs and uh, birds, and they would be sacrificed. And the high priest would have this responsibility of being a representation of, of Israel to God. And there came a time when they would, they would ceremonially wash themselves and clothe themselves in these special clothes and they would go into the temple, into the very centre, to the Holy of Holies, to be in the very presence of God. All right? There were many priests under the old system. But death prevented them from remaining in office. They all died. They were human beings. They just died. They died. And another one had to come and do it. And then another one. And then another one had to come and do it. But because Jesus lives forever, his priesthood lasts forever. Right? You don't need another priest. We've got a priest in heaven, a high priest in heaven. Therefore, he is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him, through that high priest. He's able once and forever. God's power isn't limited. He is able to save us completely. And God saves us through Jesus, that one true, perfect priest. <coughs> and what's amazing, isn't it, that, that this one true, perfect priest, Jesus, is also the one true, perfect sacrifice. He's the priest and he's the sacrifice, the lamb. All in him. Priest and the lamb. And he has done all that needs to be done to save us completely. If you believe in your 
your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, that he is Lord of your life, then you are saved. Hebrews 4, so then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses. Isn't that good news? For he has faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. Wow. We can come boldly to the throne of God? How can we do that? And there we will receive his mercy. And we will find grace to help us when we need it most. This is good news. Isn't it, isn't it good news? I'm looking for that. Yes, come on. This is good. You can't be local in church. It's a land. All right? This is not the silent time. This is the, come on. Isn't it good? Encourage me and I'll preach more. All right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I won't go on longer. I just have more passion, all right? I'll have more passion. I promise. And you know what? It's not just I'm saved completely, an individualistic thing. That's not what the Bible tells us is the good news. It's not just me. Oh, I'm saved. Phew, I get to go to heaven. In fact, heaven isn't the destination. It's not about going to heaven. God is saving all of creation. It's much bigger than just me and God. He's saving you and all those that put their faith in Jesus and generations across the globe. But he's also saving the whole of the cosmos. The whole of the universe is being saved. What he achieved on the cross is unbelievable. And so, I've been reading a book, but it took the guy who wrote it, it talks about uh, life after death, and we think of heaven, don't we, for those who have faith in Christ. But he said, actually, don't think of life after death, think life after, life after death. Life after, life after death. The life after death, yes, we go to be with Jesus in paradise. But then when he returns, when his appearing comes the second time, he makes all things new, and there's life after that, with a physical body, in a physical creation. And we get to enjoy all the goodness that God intended when he created in the first place. So his saving isn't just a personal being him. It's a massive saving completely of all that he created. It's amazing. Unbelievable. So God is able to save completely. What should we do? Give him all the glory. Shouldn't we? Yes. You can save completely. Oh, yes, good. We're getting there. We warm you up. Come on. Okay? Second one. God is able to judge. Able to judge with justice and fairness. All right, Psalm 98. He is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with justice and the nations with fairness. And in James chapter 4, God alone who gave the law is the judge. He alone has the power to save or destroy. Okay, got the power to save or to destroy. There is a day coming when all will be judged. And it is God alone who holds the ultimate power, the ultimate authority over our life over our salvation and over judgment. God alone. God has given the role of judge to another member of the Trinity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit is giving the role of judge to Jesus. Jesus will be the judge. So when Jesus appears at the end of time, when Jesus comes, he's going to take on this role of being judge. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, it says this, Christ Jesus will someday judge the living and the dead when he comes to set up his kingdom. It's going to happen. He's coming to judge. How do you feel about that prospect? How do you feel? The Jesus, Jesus is going to judge the living and the dead when he comes. I don't feel like me, sometimes when you think about judgment, you think about kind of negative feelings. I remember as a teacher, all right, and when I was a teacher and the head teacher walked in with a clipboard, I knew I was about to be judged. <laughs> okay, 
I go into performance mode and overkill and try and do it all with a singing dancing lesson, which was silly. Because I know I'm being judged and it impacted my, my, my whole being. Or, or you know you actually you were, you were driving at 40 miles an hour in that 30 mile an hour limit and suddenly you see the blue lights and you pull over and the policeman comes to your window. You're feeling judged, don't you? Because you did the wrong thing. We, 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 we see judgment as a very negative thing, don't we, in life. But that's not how the Bible sees it. According to the Bible, judgment is an opportunity for celebration. What? How can that be? Well, because God is totally fair, totally honest, will never make a wrong judgment and it's a time for joy and celebration. Listen to the rest of Psalm, Psalm 98. Uh, it's an amazing hymn praise. Sing a new song to the Lord for he has done wonderful deeds. His right hand has won a mighty victory. His holy arm has shown his saving power. Yeah, yeah, we talk about that. I mean, God saves. It's worth celebrating, isn't it? Because God saves, yes. But that's not the sole reason for this song, this psalm. Verse 2, the Lord has announced his victory and has revealed his righteousness to every nation. He has remembered his promise to love and be faithful to Israel. The ends of the earth have seen the victory of our God. Wow, so what should our response be? Verse 4, shout to the Lord. All the earth, break out in praise and sing for joy. Sing your praise to the Lord with a harp, with a harp and melodious song, with trumpets and the sound of the ram's horn. Make a joyful symphony before the Lord the King. Why are we doing this? Why? 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 Oh no, he goes on. Even creation starts to praise as well. Let the sea and everything in it shout his praise. Let the earth and all the living things join in. Let the rivers clap their hands with glee. Let the hills sing out their songs of joy before the Lord. So it's not only us praising, it's all of creation praising. Why? Well, the psalm goes on. Because he <coughs> will judge. That's why you're celebrating. He will judge the world with justice and the nations with fairness. Wow. So God's coming judgment is a time of joy and singing. It's a time of celebration for all who have put their faith in Christ. Romans 2, Paul said it right at the beginning of his letter, he said this, and this is the message I proclaim, that the day is coming when God, through Christ Jesus, will judge everyone's secret life. And John tells us what Jesus said in chapter 5, the Father judges no one, instead he has given the Son absolute authority to judge, so that everyone will honour the Son, just as they honour the Father. I tell you the truth, those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me, have eternal life. Or oh, listen to this, they will never be condemned for their sins. That was a whoop, whoop moment. That was a just moment. You missed it. Right? A judge is coming. Christ is coming to judge. But then he says, yeah, I'm coming to judge. But then he said, what was it? There will never, those who have put their faith in, in, in got eternal life, will never be condemned for their sins. That is good news, my man. It's good news, isn't it? Isn't that good news? Because they've already passed from death to life. You've done it. You died with Christ. You rose with Christ. You've already gone through it. So therefore, you will not be condemned. If you believe, if you listen to him, if you believe his message that the Father sent him, and if you accept the offer of eternal life, put in your faith in Jesus, there is no condemnation. That good, just, righteous judge, 
does not and will not condemn you for your sin. Come on, I get a smile at least. Do you realise how amazing that is? If you accept the free gift of grace, and those who, who yeah, I guess if you don't accept the free gift of grace, it's a different story. It's a different story. Remember, God is able to save and destroy. So if it's through pride, because that's often the root of sin, or through unbelief, someone decides to go their own way and not God's way, then God goes, well, your will be done then. You go that way. And judgment will come. Is that not a motivation to want to share the goodness? Is that not a motivation? And how can judgment be good? Well, I think particularly, I just want to focus on this little group of people. Those that have been victims of injustice, knowing the judgment of God is to come, is good news. It really is. If you've been wronged by others, if you've been sinned against, right? and often that's in terrible, horrendous ways. It might be that you've been sexually abused by someone. Or you've been, you know, there's been a murder in your family. Emotionally damaged by actions of others. These things can happen. But actually, the promise of the judgment day is good news. Yes, it's right we seek justice within the courts of Britain. That's right. We should do. But it doesn't always work out right, does it? Sometimes they get it wrong. Sometimes there's not enough evidence. Sometimes the perpetrator of the crime, the sin against you, is not even found. But there's going to be a day. There will be a day. And Jesus comes to judge that all will face the judgment of God. But it will be done with justice. And it will be done with mercy. And it will be done fairly. But it will come. God is able to save completely. Give God all the glory. God is able to judge with justice and fairness. So let's give him all the glory. It can feel a bit scary sometimes. What if I mess up? What if I do something really, really bad? What if, what, 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 what if, if, if the good in my life doesn't balance out bad in my life? Because we can sometimes think like that. That's not the gospel. That's other things. But we can think like that sometimes. What if that all goes on? Firstly, your salvation isn't dependent on anything you have done. It's not dependent on anything you will do in the future. Your salvation is a free gift from God, His grace given freely to all who call to Jesus to be saved. That's the first thing. But then my third, God is able is that God is able to keep us from falling. This is Jude, very little letter in the New Testament. Verse 24 says this, Now all glory to God, who is able to keep you from falling away. Wow. And then it goes on, it gets even better. And will bring you with great joy into his glorious presence without a single fault. Can you imagine it? Just imagine the scene, right? The revelation tells you the scene of heaven, doesn't it? With, with a throne, a God, the Father on the throne, and all that's going on, all the beasts, and all the angels, and all the light and the smoke. It's better than any show you can see at the West End. It'd just be amazing, wouldn't it? All right? And there's the Lamb. All right? He's able to open the scroll. And you can go and stand there. What is it? You can stand there in his glorious presence without a single fault. If it was in my own strength, I couldn't do it, could I? Why can I do it? Because of Christ in me. He's able to keep me saved. He does it, not me, he does it. 
We don't stand in the presence of our, of our wonderful God on our own merit. We don't do it because of our own track record of living a great life. It's because we are in Christ. You die to yourself. Baptism again. All right? In Christ, you died. All right? And you came to new life as you rose out of the water, as you put your faith and trust in him. So Ephesians chapter 3. Now to him who is able to do in oh, another able. Him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. According to his power that is in work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. God can do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine. For all in Christ, an amazing transaction has taken place. Just bear with me. This is me. All my fault. All my mess, all my sin, laid bare at the cross. Jesus takes this. And he takes it on himself. So he does. He takes it on himself. A transaction took place. But not only that. There's a second transaction that took place. So it's got a little logo on it. Ignore the logo. I don't know what that logo is, but anyway. Okay. This is Jesus. Pure. The spotless lamb. No blemish. No sin. This is what he does. Clothes me and you in his righteousness. That's what he does. That's what he does. It's all him. All him. God is able to save completely. Give him glory. Yeah? God is able to judge with justice and fairness. Give him glory. And God is able to keep us from falling, present us spotless before the throne of God. Deserves the glory, doesn't he? Doesn't he deserve the glory? In so many of the Bible passages that speak about the character, the qualities of God, all right? Able to make us strong. That's what Paul says in his last bit of this letter. Able to save, able to judge, able to keep us from falling, able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. There's a natural conclusion that Paul comes to, and we all should come to as well. All glory to the only wise God. Through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Jonathan, do you want to come up? With? God's power, his character, his qualities are always tied to his glory. Always. His ability magnifies his greatness. See, when we trust in God's power, when we rely on his strength and live by faith in what he can do, then we reflect his glory to the world. His ability to transform us, keep us, sustain us is evidence of his goodness. And every work he does in and through us brings praise back to him. It's amazing. So today, today, I want to encourage you. Live with a heart full of trust in God's abilities. In his ability to save. In his ability to judge fairly. In his ability to keep us. And it's not just for our own benefit, but so that his glory might be revealed through our lives. Let our faith in God, in his power, be a testimony that points others to his greatness. So let's glorify the God who is able. The one who strengthens us, saves us, sustains us and exceeds all our expectations for the sake of his name. May he be glorified in our lives, glorified in his 
church, glorified in his creation forevermore. Amen. Amen. Stand, we're going to sing. Let me just read a bit of Psalm 98 again. Then Jonathan's going to lead us to worship this amazing God. Sing a new song to the Lord, for he's done wonderful deeds. His right hand has won a mighty victory. His holy arm has shown his saving power. The Lord has announced his victory and has revealed his righteousness to every nation. He's remembered his promise to love and be faithful. The ends of the earth have seen the victory of our God. So shout to the Lord. All the earth, break out in praise. Sing for joy. Sing your praises to the Lord with a harp, with a guitar, with a voice. All right, with trumpets if you've got them. Sound the ram's horn. Make a joyful symphony before the Lord, their King. Amen.